So this is it, our 3500 Vignali spider. So what we're going to do is we'll talk a little about the history of the car, where it's been all these years. Then we'll walk around and have a look. We'll lift the hood, have a look at the numbers, make sure that they match. And then we'll hop inside and have a look at how the cockpit's laid out. So here's what we know. We purchased the build sheet from Maserati from the classic department. Uh, the build sheet, the copy of the original purchase order and some other, some other paperwork, which is quite interesting. We found out that the car, when it was new, was in these colors. So it was sold new in alpha red with a black leather interior and a black top. Um, it uh, also had these wheels, which are Barani steel wheels. They're an aluminum rim with uh, a steel center, which is, makes them a little bit lighter, which is kind of nice. The uh, vehicle cost in US dollars about $12,600 uh, when new. And um, just to put that in perspective, a new Corvette was about $4,000. So this car cost as much as three Corvettes. It was ordered through the uh, Mercedes-Benz uh, distributor in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, we understand that it was sold new by the Rolls-Royce dealer. Order was placed in April 1960, and two months later, the vehicle was ready to be shipped. So it took them about two months to build the car, which is kind of interesting. In 1964, in the classifieds in Vancouver, we found an advert, which we think is this car, and uh, if it is, it had 9,000 miles on it, and they wanted uh, $7,000 for the car. It, um, it lived in Canada right up through to about the 1990s. In the mid 80s, it had a full restoration uh, performed on it. The vehicle has held up remarkably well. Interior has nice patina. The top is in good condition. The paint, there is some shrinkage and a few cracks and chips. And the only corrosion, we've been under the car and had uh, a good look around and a good poke. There's no rust on it, but there is some corrosion along the leading edge of the hood. So uh, I anticipate someone will paint the car at some point and then they'll have to take care of that. The, um, the vehicle, they only made 242 of them, but there's quite a, quite a number of variations between the different Vignali spiders. If you look at the different cars, you'll notice there's perhaps three different uh, Trident badges on the grill. Um, the tail of the car has two different kinds of chrome. The spears along the side, there's a couple of different variations of those. So they had quite a few variations just within a short run of cars. Three different kinds of seats and two different dash layouts. So when you look at them, what you see is that there really are no two cars that are the same. Uh, they're all, you know, quite individual. Let's lift the hood and we'll take a look at the numbers. So here it is, the heart of the automobile. Uh, Maserati in the 1950s was known for uh, racing. And when you lift the hood, there's so much in this engine compartment that speaks to racing and high performance. We have uh, twin plugs per cylinder, uh, twin ignition coils up on the firewall. There's an oil cooler next to the radiator, triple Weber carburetors. Uh, the distributor is just a mess of spark plug leads coming out. So it really speaks to racing and high performance, which is what Maserati was known for. The engine is a straight six twin cam, three and a half liters, puts out 220 horsepower. And uh, Ferrari was probably their biggest competitor. Ferrari at the time, their road cars were putting out 240. They had 12 cylinders, 240 horsepower. Maserati was 220 in the same neighborhood. The, the other competition, uh, 300 SL Roadster, uh, was a six cylinder, 212 horsepower. Uh, Jag and Aston Martin were both six cylinder twin cams, about 240 horsepower. So in that 210 to 240 is where high performance cars were back in 1957, 1958. So what Maserati produced was something right in keeping with the competition. The numbers on the car are relatively easy to look for. There's a chassis plate and it moves around on these cars depending on the year, but it's, uh, 
It's normally on the uh, driver's side up front here. The chassis number on Maseratis in general, it's on the driver's side suspension tower. You can see it stamped right in there. So that should match what you see on the plate. Now the next thing is kind of odd. The engine number is the same as the chassis number. So they stamped the same number into the engine on the back of the engine um, on the carburetor side. But the odd thing is that a very large percentage of Maserati 3500s left the factory with no engine number stamped. Now, I've never heard a good reason why. No one's ever, I've never even heard a reason why that happened. But it could be um, a third or more are missing the, the engine number. So that flat spot where the engine number should go is just missing. You can be looking at a matching number car uh, with its original engine and not know it. So there's a way to get around that. Um, what you have to do is reach out to Maserati, their classic department, give them a chassis number, and you have to give them the numero interno. That's the Maserati's internal number uh, for the engine. And the way you find that is look for the generator, and then there's a uh, adjusting rod that goes between the generator and the engine. Follow that to the engine, and right next to where it connects, you'll see a two or three digit number. It's always stamped in that spot, so it's pretty easy to find. Just look for the generator and follow the adjusting rod. So you copy that number down, copy the chassis number, email or call Maserati, uh, you can get a build sheet from them, and then they'll tell you if it's matching or not. And as I say, about a third of them uh, are not matching, num are matching number, but don't have the engine number stamped. The numero interno is also stamped on the back of the head, and sometimes you find it on the oil pan as well. Um, disc brakes up front, uh, drum brakes in the rear, four-speed gearbox, a ZF gearbox, and a Salisbury rear axle, English rear axle, which is standard equipment. Uh, seven ratios available on the rear axle, which is quite nice. Let's uh, jump in the car and uh, have a look at the layout. So the first thing is just, you know, the fact that it feels nice in here. It, it feels like everything is positioned exactly where you would want it to be. You know, levers and knobs and just everything is quite, quite comfortable. Uh, if you said that we had to be in this car driving all day, I wouldn't have a problem. Or if we were heading to California, you could just go and I think it'd be a pretty easy day. Large Nardi steering wheel, which is really quite magnificent. They had a couple of different variations. They had variations on everything. Two or three different steering wheels. Uh, it needs to be a large steering wheel because there's no power steering. Um, and at slow speeds, you have to crank on it. And a, a bigger steering wheel makes that, uh, makes that easier. Uh, British Jaeger gauges. So a British gauges in an Italian sports car, which is interesting. Three small gauges. Some cars have five. And one of the things I find interesting is this kind of array of switches and knobs, and there's no labels. You're expected to, I think, either trial and error or uh, dig out the owner's handbook, wipers at one end, choke at the other, and then switches for um, headlights. These are the heater controls. I mean, you've got to kind of monkey around with them to figure out exactly what they do and where they blow the hot air. This is kind of cute. I thought it was a cigarette lighter. It's a map light. It's kind of nice. And then it switches off when it goes in. I like that a lot. The uh, rear view mirror is actually quite a difficult thing. If you ever come across one that's missing, they're really hard to find. When Road and Track tested the vehicle in 1962, they found that the speedometer was very optimistic. They said only to be matched by Ferrari. So apparently the speedometer reads about 10% faster than what you're going. And I don't think it's a problem. I like to go fast and if it tells me I'm going faster, I'm okay with it. There's only one um, lever on the steering column and that's turn signals. Uh, and also if you push it forward and back, it's the dips, you know, the dips for the lights and it'll also flash the lights which I think of as very Italian. You know, somebody's slow in front, you can, you know, flash the lights. Get out of my way. 